We're very glad to have back with us Brother Johnny James. And this year he brought his wife. Aren't we glad to have Sister James with us? Brother James, we love you, brother. We want you to open your heart up and preach to us. He preached for us Sunday night. And let me tell you this. You, if, you, if you don't buy anything at the bookstore, you want to get the tape of Sunday night's message. He preached on when second is better than first. The second Adam is better than the first one. The second birth is better than the first one. And the second coming is going to be better than the first one. But folks, he's got, he's got so much scripture in there, it's unbelievable. Welcome him as he comes to preach the book. Greetings in Jesus' name, everybody, and please be seated. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in Alexandria. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in Rapids County, Rapids Parish. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in Louisiana. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the United States of America. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in North America. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the Western Hemisphere. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the world. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the solar system. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the galaxy. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the universe. I greet you in Jesus' name because Jesus' name is the greatest name in the spiral Nubia. I greet you in Jesus' name because there's no name nowhere like Jesus' name. Greetings in Jesus' name, everybody. And please be seated. Somebody said to me, Brother James, how would you have liked to have been living when Peter, Paul, and James, and John, and them, and the apostles of the Lamb were preaching? And my response was, not necessarily. I said, like this, on this order, I'm glad I'm living when Anthony Mangan is preaching. I'm glad I'm living when Vesta Mangan is preaching. And I'm sure enough glad I'm living when G.A. Mangan is preaching because he trained both of them. I'm glad I'm living when Denver Stanford is preaching. I'm glad I'm living when J.T. Pugh is preaching. I'm glad I'm living when Mike Williams is preaching. I'm glad I'm living when Randy Keyes is preaching and Wayne Huntley is preaching. I'm glad I'm living when you guys are preaching. I'm glad I'm living at this time here and now. I'm sure enough glad I'm preaching, living when Roland Baker is preaching because Roland Baker is pastoring some of my children and some of my grandchildren and he's putting some good word in them. I'm glad I'm living when John Hopkins is preaching because John Hopkins is preaching down there in Panama and he's telling them, Deus Eno speak, Deus is una spiritune, Jesus is Deus. And comes here and tells us, God is a spirit, Jesus is God. Apostolic brother, I am glad I'm preaching when you are preaching. You are the greatest preachers ever. The preachers of the apostolic who are preaching right now. I want to thank Pastor Anthony Mangan and the board for the great invitation, T.F. Tinney and the board and all of you, the invitation to be here and my wife accompanying me and being this outstanding word worshiping experience. It is something else. It is extraordinary. It's just a delight to be here and I'm here in Jesus' name. Well, the Bible says in Jonah 3, 1 and 2, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And the key word is preach. 
The Bible says in St. Mark 16, 15 and 16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Again, the key word is preach. And the Bible says in Luke 9 and 60, Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And again, the key word is preach. In 2 Timothy 4 and 2, it says, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And again, the key word is preach. Let me throw one more in. The Bible says in Acts 8, 4 and 5, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And verse 5 says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And again, the key word is preach and preaching. And this is a preacher's conference. And what better time than in a preacher's conference to preach about preaching. I want to preach about preaching. I'm, I'm thankful for coming to Because of the Times 98. Nothing has changed my life like that meeting and preaching for me. From Because of the Times 98, I have preached in over 200 churches that I didn't even know existed and have received at least two phone calls every week since that time. Thank you, Pastor Mangan, for bringing me here to be cause of the times. And this is, this is a preacher's conference. And that is, that is exactly why I want to preach about preaching. I'm a traveling preacher. And the Lord has blessed me to preach in every one of the 50 of the United States of America. I'm not too much overseas inclined. I like to stay in the United States of America. And I've noticed a trend in preaching in America. And I'm not talking about them. I'm talking mainly about us. Preaching has fallen on hard times. Preaching is going through a difficult period. America is in a moral mess. The church has grown cold. Some of us are apathetic lukewarm like a leaking faucet ain't turned off ain't turned on don't love nobody don't hate nobody don't care if you do and don't care if you don't and i got news for you only preaching will get us right only preaching will straighten things out we need preaching preaching will do what nothing else will do But the devil has deceived and tricked a lot of us apostolics. And we have fallen into this thing where we are doing everything but preaching under the disguise of preaching. That's exactly why I want to preach about preaching is because everybody that is supposed to be preaching is not preaching. And the reason we are having the problems in our country and in our churches is because preaching is not in its proper place. And I want to preach about preaching. Now there are three disciplines under the umbrella of theology that deal with preaching. These three disciplines are hermeneutics, homiletics, and apologetics. Hermeneutics is the science of preaching. Homiletics is the art of preaching and apologetics is the proof of preaching. So a preacher should be hermeneutically accurate, homiletically natural, and apologetically convincing. In other words, the preacher should exegete the scripture correctly, use their own natural style, convince the saints to straighten up and fly right, and convince the sinner to come clean or stay away dirty. That's what preaching will do. But we have been watching them other cats, them televangelists and them soul hustlers, them ecclesiastical pimps, them messages of Satan and them angels of hell. And some of us think that we are supposed to be doing like they're doing. Now, in homiletics there's a rule. There's a rule in homiletics that says if you preach a subject your subject must be contained in the text. You can't take a text about one thing and then announce a subject 
about something else like we have seen. You haven't seen it here. Everybody here has been homiletically and homiletically correct. But you've seen it where they read a scripture and don't even come close to that scripture. That, in homiletics, that is called eisegesis. That is not to be done. You are supposed to have a subject contained in the text. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I want to violate that rule. Because all the verses that I've given to you have shown you the value, the credibility, the authenticity, the blessedness, the sacredness of preaching. And I want to talk to you from the subject today, how to preach and help nobody. How to preach and save nobody. How to preach and heal nobody. How to preach and convert nobody. Why am I talking like this? Because this is what's going on in a whole lot of pulpits. Apostolic brethren, you better go home and preach. You better go home and preach. The folk in your church don't need counseling. They need preaching. They need the word. You better go home and preach. Because preaching will do it. Somebody asked me, say, Brother James, you got too many verses when you preach. Let me tell you why I like a lot of verses. That way if the sermon don't go over and is a flop, you can't go home and say, we didn't get no word. <laughs> I give you enough verses that if, if I don't bring out nothing, you have already heard the word. And the word of God is good for everybody. Because the word of God will lift your spirit. The word of God will stretch your mind. The word of God will thrill your soul. The word of God will warm your heart. You ain't living right. The word of God will tan your hide. We need preaching. We need word. You know, men, men divide horizontally. When men divide, it's high class, middle class, low class. God does not divide horizontally. God divides perpendicularly. When God divides his sheep, goat, is saved, lost, is right, wrong, is heaven, hell, is dead, didn't. But in the division of men, high class, middle class, low class, I don't care what category they put you in, you need preaching. And you need to hear the word. I challenge every preacher, don't be like them cats who have gone to the same seminary and studied under the same professors and they have learned their lesson well and they have learned how to preach and help nobody. It ain't no problem in your church that preaching won't fix. It ain't no situation that preaching can't deal with if you just preach. You got a problem in your church, you don't need to bring in no behavior scientist with a PhD talking 13 cylinder triple jointed knee action words. Just preach! Preaching will do it because God designed preaching to do it. Just look at here for a minute. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't mind preaching but not in Nineveh. Jonah wanted to preach at the national conference. Jonah wanted to preach at because of the times. He didn't want to go to no places like Nineveh and preach. But the Bible said, Jonah 1.17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Let me tell you something, preacher. If you don't preach what God said, like he said it, God got a whale that won't swallow nobody but you. You better do what God said. You better go back home and preach. <laughs> when that sea monster, Jesus alluded to that in Matthew 12 and 40 and Jesus, Jesus said for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth when that sea monster vomited up Jonah he was glad to preach and the Bible said that Nineveh was an exceeding great city three days journey and when Jonah entered one day's journey into the city that is not saying he made a three day trip in one day no, Nineveh was an exceeding great city walking on foot Pat and turner, pat your feet and turn the corner. It would take you three days 
to walk across Nineveh, but Jonah entered one day's journey into the city about 10 miles, and when he got into the city, Jonah began to preach. Nineveh had a population of 60,000 people. Jonah preached in Nineveh, and the city of Nineveh was not saved by the politicians. It was not saved by the educators. It was not saved by behavior science. The preaching of Jonah saved Nineveh. The whole city was saved by preaching. That's why the devil don't want you to preach. That's why the devil wants you to do everything in your pulpit but preach. Don't be like that. Preaching saved the city of Nineveh. The devil don't, don't want you to preach. The Bible said in Acts 6 and 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer, to the ministry of the word. Prayer and preaching go together like bacon and eggs, hot dogs and mustard, apple pie and ice cream, and Nashville and country music. Don't let the devil deceive you. You pray and you preach. Preaching saved Nineveh. Nineveh had as many people as Alexandria, Louisiana, and the city got saved by preaching. Jesus said unto them in St. Mark 16, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus told you what to preach, the gospel. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If the word damned offends you, the modern translation says condemned, but the Bible we use says damned. If you be, believe preaching, you'll be saved. Don't believe preaching, you'll be damned. Anybody can see that. That's clear as the sun at noonday. It ain't but two bees. It's a saved bee and a damned bee. And preaching will determine which bee you be. And if you want folk to be the right bee, you better preach them. And in Luke 9, 57, a man came to Jesus. And the man was overwhelmed with the magnitude and the immensity of the ministry of Jesus. And the man said to Jesus in Luke 9, 57, I'll follow you anywhere you go. And in Luke 9, 58, Jesus told the man, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man is not a place to lay his head. See, that man thought, that Jesus was staying at the Hyatt Regency or the Hilton with Mark Hamby and T.D. Jakes and them guys. And when that man found out that Jesus lived on the street, he didn't want nothing else to do with Jesus. And he must have left running because walking was too slow. But another man popped up and said, I'll follow you. Let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, listen, Luke 9, 60, let the dead bury their dead. Let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead and you go and preach the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You can't eat your way in and you can't drink your way in. You got to have the Holy Ghost. You got to be born again. <laughs> Last night, Brother Dale, he's a blessed man. Thank you for Brother Dale. He took my wife and I and my grandson to the seafood place. He said, he said Brother James, they got a buffet. I said, that's the very place I want to go because I like that word. It's in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. 1 Corinthians 12 and 7. St. Paul said, the messenger of Satan was sent to B-U-F-F-E-T me. Oh, where we ate, they had a B-U-F-F-E-T. Hold it, wait a minute. Over at the restaurant, B-U-F-F-E-T is a noun. And in the Bible, B-U-F-F-E-T is a verb. At the restaurant is buffet, and in the Bible is buffet. But to make sure that I had all the bases covered, Brother Paul Pamer, when I got over there, I buffeted the buffet. <laughs> We were, we were sitting at a table behind Jack Cunningham and Meryl Ewing, and I was trying to keep up with them. We buffeted the buffet. <laughs> but the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. You can't eat your way in. You can't drink your way in. You've got to be born again. 
So Paul told Timothy, a young clergyman, he said in 2 Timothy 4 and 2, preach the word. Say, be instant, in season, and out of season. Out of season. And look what preaching does. He said, reprove. Folk think that preaching is only supposed to get you happy. He said, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. All of those verses show you the goodness of preaching. Acts 8 and 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. The value of preaching. Well, why is it? This trend is trying to come in among us. where we're trying to be like them other folk and not doing it like it's supposed to be done. So here's what you need to do then. If you ain't got no better sense than that, I'm going to tell you now how to do it. Here's how to preach and help nobody. How to preach and bless nobody. How to preach and heal nobody. Here's how you preach and help nobody. Make your chief aim popularity. Make that popularity the number one thing on your agenda. Whatever you do, seek to be popular. Understand, brothers and sisters, popularity is the status quo. Popularity is the general opinion. Popularity is what everybody likes. And in, in reality, all that popularity is, is worldliness. So when I say seek to be popular, I'm saying seek to be worldly. If you want to preach and help nobody, make popularity your chief aim. Be like the world. Monkey see, monkey do. Come on, you can do the monkey too. If you want to be popular, that's the way to go. <laughs> Didn't the Bible tell us in Galatians 1 and 4, we're delivered from the world? Didn't the Bible say in James 1 27, we should be unspotted by the world? Didn't the Bible say in 1 John 3 and 1, we are not known of the world? Didn't the Bible say in Romans 12 and 2, not be conformed to this world? The Bible didn't, God didn't save you and call you out to be like the world. He calls you out in Matthew 5, 14 to be the light of the world. He calls you in St. Mark 16, 16 to preach to the world. He calls you in St. John 17, 15 to witness to the world and not be like the world. If you want to preach and help nobody, be worldly, be popular. <laughs> yeah. Worldliness is easy to define. Don't be like them. All you got to do is look around you. And however they doing, don't do like them. Whatever they wearing, don't wear it. Or whatever they saying, don't say it. Our preachers are trying to look like them, dress like them, and talk like them. They must not want to preach and help nobody. Don't be worldly. You a sanctified apostolic man. You work on a job. Go to work tomorrow. And look around you. And all the guys on your job, the way they look and act and talk, just don't be like them. Now I guarantee you, you won't be, be you'll be not being worldly. <clears throat> you a sanctified woman, go to work tomorrow. And look in your office. And look around you. And look at the women in your office. And just don't be like them. Now hold it, sisters. I got news for you. It ain't no sin to be sexy. Foxy, attractive and fine. But God don't want you all painted up looking like no pagan female goddess that inherited the cosmetic department of a Kmart store. God don't want you looking like no Las Vegas showgirl. God wants you to look godly. And he wants you to look holy. He don't want you to be worldly. <laughs> To be popular is to be like them. That, wor that worldly woman give me big scare. When it comes to dress, she take no dare. Everything false, her face all pink. The pads is where the woman she ain't. Her dress is so short, you can see it all. It don't matter whether she's short or tall. She flashed them eyes, she loved to flirt. She wiggled and shake in a miniskirt. She jitterbug when she should walk. I even think her name is false. But the apostolic 
woman, she's so fine, she know who she is, she's one of a kind. The apostolic woman, she looks so nice, she know who she is, she bought with a price. The apostolic woman don't take no mess, she had Jesus on the inside, and she know how to dress. Don't be like the world. <laughs> If, if you want to preach, if you want to preach and help nobody, go back home and do everything it takes to be popular. And I'll guarantee you, or you'll get some followers, but your church ain't going to be no church. It ain't going to be nothing but a Sunday morning club that starts at 10 o'clock sharp and gets out at 12 o'clock dull. If you want to preach and help nobody, Aim to be popular. If you want to preach and help nobody, use I and me as much as you can and talk about yourself. All the emphasis placed upon your own self. Because the time you're talking about yourself is the time you ought to be talking about Jesus. And what, can any, what has anybody got to say about their own self anyway? When we are not but seven minutes and two quarts of oxygen away from death, if Jesus don't give us strength, we ain't got the strength to crack an egg on Easter. We can't mash a hand, bust a grape, or tie a chicken. If you want to preach and help nobody, talk about yourself. Don't you know nobody is qualified unequivocally with no strings attached to talk about themselves but Jesus? No wonder Jesus said in St. John 12, 31 and 32, Now is the judgment of this world come. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up for now, and I will draw men unto me. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said in St. John 14 and 3, and if I go, and that if is not if in the if sense, that since I go, if I go, since I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Only Jesus Christ is qualified to say I. So don't be, if you want to preach and help nobody, talk about yourself. Armies have marched, navies have sailed, air forces have flown, writers have have written, singers have sang, players have played, philosophers have philosophized, theologians have theologized, but Jesus Christ is the only one capable and competent and able with no strings attached to say I, all by himself. <coughs> when, when God called Moses, he was 10 years older than me. He was 80. Somebody said to me, when, they, when I turned 70, they said, Johnny, how do it feel to be 70? I said, 70? <laughs> they said, age ain't nothing but a number. I said, if age ain't nothing but a number, King Kong wasn't nothing but a monkey. <laughs> and this brother who was 69 said, I feel like I did when I was 17. I said, you done forgot what 17 feel like. <laughs> but God called Moses. He was 80. Moses had five complaints. But age was not one of them. And Moses said, well, when I get down there and talk to Israel, what shall I say to them? Who shall I say sent me? God told Moses, Exodus 3, 14, tell the children of Israel, Ek ye asher, ek ye have sent you. Now when they translated that, into English, they didn't have enough space to put it in there in its fullest intent, so they just translated it, I am that I am. Eke Asher, Eke, God is saying, I am who I was, I am who I is, I am who I will be. I am that I am. I am what I was, I am what I is, I am what I will be, I am that I am. I am where I was, I am where I is, I am where I will be, I am that I am. I am why I was, I am why I is, I am why I will be, I am that I am. I am which I was, I am which I is, I am which I will be, I am that I am. Tell your school teacher that's bad grammar, but it's good theology. He can be anything he wants to be. 
If you want to preach and help nobody, seek to be popular and talk about yourself. If you want to preach and help nobody, copy the styles of the televangelists and the big name preachers. And I'll guarantee you, your church will not be blessed and you won't help nobody. You see, here's the problem with copying folk. Every copycat is a nobody. Because you ain't the cat you copying because they them. And you're not yourself because you're trying to be them. So if you copy some televangelist or some big name preacher, you are a reverend nobody. You are a brother nobody. God wants you to be you. Not be a copycat. <laughs> there was a tombstone. There was a tombstone that said, Here lies the body of Billy Poppy. He was born an original, but he died a copy. Don't you know, apostolic brother, apostolic woman, God created you to be an original. That night that your daddy said to your mama, can I? And your mama said, yes, darling, but be gentle. And your mama got together with your daddy and conceived you. Don't you know God programmed your deoxyribonucleic acid genetic coding and then told the RNA, do what the DNA told you to do. God made you to be you, you by yourself. And then God got, gave you the Holy Ghost and blew on you. God want to use you in a unique way. Like God ain't going to use nobody else. But God can't use you when you try to be somebody else. If you want to preach and help nobody, copy the big name preachers. <coughs> A preaching that's falling on hard times, we're going to turn it around. And we're going to straighten it out. Here's how you preach and help nobody. Use big words and be deep. Oh, folk love that. People love it when you use those 13-cylinder, triple-jointed, knee-action words. So if you want to preach and help nobody, use big words and be deep. And they will walk out and say, he showed it, preached. And won't know nothing you said. If you are preaching from 2 Kings 2.23 and you are preaching about Elisha, the prophet who was bald-headed, don't tell the folk Elisha was bald-headed. Tell the people you want to preach about the prophet who had no follicular appendages on the cutaneous apex of his cranial structure, anterior to the sagittal suture, and posterior to the lambdoidal suture, where the follicular appendages do habitually germinate. 31 words can be said in two words. Ball-headed. <laughs> but don't say ball-headed. See, if you say bald-headed, even the little kids will know what you're talking about. But you don't want to help nobody. You want to be deep and impressive. Here's how you're preaching help nobody. Here's how you're preaching help nobody. Never pray. Never fast. And never study. Because if you pray, you'll be anointed. If you fast, You'll be humble. And if you study, you have the message and you have something to say. And look, if you pray, you'll be anointed. You don't want to be anointed. You want to be popular. If you fast, you'll be humble. You don't want to be humble. You want to be proud. And if you study, you have something to say. And you don't want to have no message because you're going to use all them gimmicks to act like you got a message when you ain't got one. That's how you preach and help nobody. Don't you know? My grandson, James the Elder, the, brother, the big black brother you see with me with around here, that's my grandson in the gospel. He's a powerful Calvary preacher. It's just the best that we went back to the hotel. He said to me, he said, Grandfather, how can that woman preach like that? I said, that's the man who is one of the prayingest women who ever lived. I said, prayer is what gave her that power. You cannot be much for God and not be much with God. How do you think God going to use you at night when you're messed up all day long? <coughs> prayer gives you God's anointing. Of course, in this apostolic world, a lot of us don't know what the anointing is. 
Some of y'all think the anointing is the Hammond organ and the Leslie speaker. <coughs> Some of y'all think the anointing is mob psychology and mass hysteria. Some of y'all think the anointing is a feeling. You can feel the anointing, but the anointing is not a feeling. I preached for a brother who got a hold of me from this meeting. And this brother, in the town I was preaching, I don't know if there was any, even any black people in the town. I preached for this brother eight days. And I was there so long, I didn't even feel black no more. <laughs> and on the last night of the service, I went down in the basement of the church. There's a long mirror along the wall. I went down and I looked in the mirror and saw myself. I said, hey, a black guy going to come out to church tonight. Looking at my own self in the mirror. <clears throat> I didn't feel black. But that didn't stop me from being black. You ain't got to feel the anointing to be anointed. If you are anointed, you are anointed. And the anointing comes through prayer. <laughs> One time a fellow introduced me to another fellow. He said, this is Johnny. He said, he happens to be a preacher. Hey, what do you mean I happened to be a preacher? I didn't happen to be a preacher. Jesus found me in sin, raised me from the dead, saved me, called, chose, prepared, and sent me to preach. That ain't no chance or accident. You ain't preaching by accident. You are not preaching by chance. You are preaching because God called you, God chose you, and God wants to use you. <laughs> and if you want God's anointing, you'll be a person of prayer. Have you noticed? In the Bible, Jesus never taught a class on apologetics, hermeneutics, or homiletics. He never taught a class on philosophy of religion, exegetical theology, or none of that stuff. All but Jesus did teach a class. He set them down in St. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and he taught them how to pray. If you want the favor of God, you'll be a person of prayer. There are no great people, only praying people that God will use greatly. God will use you greatly if you will pray. <laughs> Somebody said practice makes perfect. That's dumb. Those guys in the NBA practice three hours a day during the off season. And they practice two hours on off days and one hour game days. And with all that practicing, the best shooter in the NBA is now shooting 48% from the field. Meaning every time he shoot the ball 100 times, he missed 52. You call that perfect? How would you like to go to a doctor who said, I only lose 52 people out of every 100 I treat and the other 48 live? You wouldn't go to that doctor. Practice don't make perfect. Practice makes you good. Reading makes you smart. Study makes you ready. Praise makes you happy. Fasting makes you humble. Eating makes you fat. But prayer makes perfect. Prayer makes perfect. If you want to see perfection, then you better pray. <coughs> see, you are VIP. Thank you again. You are VIP. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, you ain't your own, you bought with a price. 1 Peter 1 19, the price was the precious blood of Jesus. How much is it worth? $100 a pint? Not enough. $1,000? Not enough. Million dollars? Not enough. Trillion dollars? Not enough. Quadrillion dollars? Not enough. Quintillion? Not enough. Sextillion? Not enough. Septillion? Not enough. Octillion dollars? Not enough. No million? Not enough. Decillion, not enough. Undecillion, not enough. Duo decillion, not enough. Trey decillion, not enough. Quattro decillion, not enough. Quint decillion, not enough. Septim decillion, not enough. Octo decillion, not enough. Zudabillion, still not enough. You couldn't buy one drop of the blood of Jesus and he bought you with his blood. You are a precious preacher. You are somebody special. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are a VIP, a very important person and a very important preacher. Don't let them trick you. Don't fall into that trap. <laughs> you belong to Jesus. He called and chose you to preach. 
And it ain't your choice of what you preach either. The federal government says you are a taxpayer. The politician says you are a voter. The attorney declares you to be a client. The physician says you're a patient. School teacher says you are a student. The retailer says you are a shopper. The bank calls you a depositor. The airlines call you a passenger. Hotel calls you a guest. TV station calls you a viewer. Radio station calls you a listener. The folks next door call you a neighbor. The church calls you a parishioner. Hope they can call you a tither. But Jesus calls you mine. Jesus said you mine. Mine are thine. Thine are mine. You belong to Jesus Christ. You ain't got no say in this. You better preach. And you better preach God's word. <laughs> Prayer will give you God's favor. The anointing, the anointing is the power and the authority and the favor and the blessing of God upon you that make you effective. When you are anointed, you ain't got to do cartwheels and flips and holler. When you are anointed, you can speak it and it's there. When you got the anointing, it happens. And the anointing, I like what Wayne, Hunt, Wayne Huntley said last night. You got to fake it and not fake it. You cannot fake the anointing to heaven. You can fake it to folk. Folk might think you are anointed, but you won't be. And fake anointing does not work. Want to be anointed? You're in a relationship with Jesus. You belong to him. The relationship is prayer. He said, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The relationship with Jesus gives you his perfection and you will be, anointed. You'll be an anointed preacher. Our Father, the perfect parent, which art the perfect existence in heaven, the perfect place, hallowed, the perfect holiness, be thy name, the perfect name, thy kingdom come, the perfect government, thy will, the perfect legal document, be done, the perfect service in earth as it is in heaven, the perfect contrast, give us the perfect petition, this day, the perfect timing, our daily bread, the perfect provision, and forgive us our debts, the perfect forgiveness, as we forgive our debtors, the perfect reciprocation, and lead us not into temptation, the perfect guidance, but deliver us from evil, the perfect deliverance, for thine is the perfect owner, the kingdom, the power, and the glory, the perfect property, forever, the perfect duration, amen, the perfect benediction, you got perfection with Jesus, but it comes through prayer. <laughs> So if you want to preach and help nobody, don't never pray and don't never fast. Because fasting will sure enough make you humble. The Bible said in Proverbs 16, 18, pride go before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 16, these six things that the Lord hate, seven are an abomination unto him. And the number one thing on God's hate list is a proud look. Arrogant and uppityness ain't going to make it. You can't do it like that. That's how you preach and help nobody. Don't let that spirit get in you and don't let it get in your church. They're trying to preach and help nobody. They are egotistic. They are humanistic. They are capitalistic. They are materialistic. They are heathenistic and paganistic. All wrapped up in themselves. Anybody wrapped up in themselves is wrapped up in the smallest package in the world. Don't be like that because you will not bless people. That's how you preach and help nobody. And don't study, please. Or if you study, you have something to say. I don't know how anybody can think that God's going to blow on them. They say, open your mouth and the Lord will fill it. He'll fill it with air. Have y'all ha <coughs> noticed T.F. Tenney? Every time he opened his mouth, whether it's casual conversation, preaching or whatever, something good comes out of it. That didn't happen by chance. That man has put that stuff in there. Tenney and J.G. Pugh know stuff they don't even know that they know they know so much stuff. The Holy Ghost got to bring it back and recall it. <laughs> but they put it in. They did it in their formative years. I got, a, I got a preacher friend and he has an organ player he carries with him because he's an evangelist. His organ player got sick and he canceled all of his meetings. 
I said, man, if you will fast, pray, and study, you will find out you can have revival and don't have to have a special organ player to make up for what you ain't got. He said to me, oh, Johnny, I know what's happening. He said, I've been holding revivals for 13 years. I said, if you fast and pray and study, you'll stop holding it and release it. The revival has been held too long. It's time for the revival to be released. And if you fast, pray, and study, the revival will be released. <laughs> and and we, we happened to meet up in St. Louis. I had just preached for my friend, Reverend Steve Williford. And he was preaching across town for Bishop James Johnson. So we got to, we said, I said, I'll get together, man, and have breakfast with you. He said, all right, I'll meet you at 8. I said, no, man, I don't do mornings. <coughs> I said, let's have breakfast at one. He said, that's lunch. I said, man, let me explain to you. Breakfast is break fast. I don't care if it's four in the evening, and I don't care if it's steak and potatoes. If it's the first meal, it's break fast. It's breakfast. He said, well, I can't, he said, I can't do nothing. He said, because at 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock, I'm tied up. I thought he was going to be in prayer and study. He said, my stories come on. I said, man, you ought to be whipped with an ignorant stick. He said, he said, you don't watch the stories? I said, man, I ain't got time for that dumb stuff. I said, you mean to tell me I'm a traveling preacher, preaching one hour a night, got 23 hours a day to do what I want to do, and I'm going to waste that valuable time? I could be praying and getting in the Word and reading some good books. I'm going to waste that time watching the soaps. I said, I ain't thinking about that. I said, furthermore, the Bible said it in the 30th Psalm, verse number 5, weeping man do it for a night. But joy comes in the morning, and that's the real edge of night. And Psalms 119, 105, it said, Thy word is the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. That's the real guiding light. And Proverbs 418 says, The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And there's your search for tomorrow. Look at them out there, standing on the edge of night, holding the guiding light, and they searching for tomorrow. The Bible said in Exodus 32 and 6, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You know who that was? That was the young and the restless. And the Bible said in Psalm 47, 3, she uncovered her thigh, made bare her leg. You know who she was? She was the bold and the beautiful. And the Bible said in Jeremiah 31, 3, God said, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. To me, that looks like love of life. But 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I got good news for you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Where are you now? You're in another world. And Hebrews 9, 27, the Bible said it is appointed under men once to die. You got to straighten up and fly right because you ain't got but one life to live. And the Bible said in Hebrews 13 and 6, Jesus said to the writer of Hebrews, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. How long is that? All the days of our lives. <laughs> and if you, if you get sick, if you get sick and you ain't got White Cross, Blue Cross, Medicare, Medicaid, you ain't got to panic and fall out. Because James 5, 14, God got a medical program. God said, call for the elders of the church. And the Bible said when they show up, they will anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Keep your priorities straight. Ain't nothing happening with the oil. The power is in the name. You can use motor oil, transmission oil, cod liver oil, any kind of oil you want. Make sure you use the name of Jesus. The power is in the name. <laughs> and the Bible said the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And you won't end up in the general hospital. Looking up at the doctors. And Isaiah 8, 18 said, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me. That's all my children. And Ecclesiastes 1 and 9 said, The thing which has been is the thing which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. To me that looks like your as the world turns. And Colossians 1, 27, the Bible said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And if Ryan don't get baptized in Jesus' name, and if Ryan don't get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, and if Ryan don't live holy, Ryan ain't got no hope. 
They're standing on the edge of night, holding the guiding light, searching for tomorrow. The young and the restless and the bold and the beautiful are looking for a love of life in another world. They know they ain't got but one life to live all the days of their life, and they don't want to end up flat, in their, flat on their back in the general hospital, away from all their children, looking up at the doctors as the world turns, and Jesus Christ is the hope. Ryan's hope is Jesus. Our hope is Jesus. Focus on Jesus Christ. If you are preaching and want to preach and help nobody, you watch that old dumb stuff. Tie up your time in dumb stuff and you'll never preach and help nobody. You won't have no anointing. You won't have no favor. Here's how you preach and help nobody. Never preach about how to be born again and what it takes to get saved. Just tell people, believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Never preach baptism in Jesus' name that offends people. Never preach and tell them they got to have the Holy Ghost. Because if you preach that, you will offend people. Anytime you are a preacher... And you are preaching to people and you don't tell them how to come out of sin and get into heaven. I don't care what they get healed from. I don't care what they get blessed with. You missed the whole point. First Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world for you to be healed. No. Christ Jesus came into the world for you to have a Cadillac or a Lincoln. No. Christ Jesus came into the world for you to have a split level ranch house with a hydronic spring zone cooling system and a step down den and a full length mink coat. No! Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if you don't tell sinners how to be saved, if you don't have a passion for souls, you've missed the whole purpose. You need to go to General Motors or General Dynamics or AT&T and get you a job. You don't belong in the ministry. <laughs> Because you're helping nobody. You're blessing nobody. You're healing nobody. <laughs> I was talking to a neo-theologian, and he said to me, Are you still preaching the baptism in Jesus' name? I said, the Bible said in Isaiah 48, the grass withered, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word ain't changed, and Jesus haven't changed, but I, since you have, I said, since you have changed, all I want to know is, was you crazy then, or are you crazy now? Because you couldn't have had good sense both times. And he said to me, let me explain baptism. I said, explain it. He said, in Acts 2, 38, where it said, for the remission of sins, he said in the Greek, that means because of. He said, you see, Johnny, I know a little Greek. I said, you do? I said, how tall is he? <coughs> I said, he must be about four foot and one. Because I know a big Greek. He's ten feet tall. He's three feet taller than Shaq. His name is Marvin Treese. And I said, he's saying in his book, the literal word, Acts, verse, volume, on page 78, paragraph 2, that when it comes to the discussion of the preposition for, in the Greek is epsilon and iota sigma, ice, he said it means not because of, or for the purpose of, or to accomplish, and there are over 30 translations of the English Bible that everybody reads, and none of them translate Acts 2.38 because of. How come? Because the grammar will not allow it. Don't you let them fellas trick you into lightening up on the baptism in Jesus' name. Don't you let nobody jive you into not preaching this truth because you are robbing people of a chance to go to heaven. <laughs> Here's how you preach and help nobody. I'm winding down. He said, he said, all of us have 55 minutes. That's all right. My mama told me 45 minutes was long enough for a good sermon and too long for a bad one. Somebody said, suppose the Lord came, come in. Suppose the Lord come in, you must be retarded. This is because of the times. The Lord don't come in. He lives here. This is his address. He's always here. In between meetings, he's still here. <coughs> 
How you a preacher to help nobody? Never praise and worship except when you lead. We are turning out a we are turning out a generation of young preachers who ain't nothing but praise hustlers. If you are a real praiser, you are praise over in the corner all by yourself. <laughs> if you want to preach and help nobody, sit up and look stiff like a Texas mule in Arkansas. And then when they turn it over to you, all of a sudden get a praise fit. They they got they got praise so far the context is a shame. They preaching now, all you gotta do is praise. You can smoke cools and praise. You can smoke dope and praise. You can live any kind of way and praise. You can be a homosexual and praise. And they preach that praise is the cure all for every dilemma of a saint. If you read in the book of Judges 1, it said after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites? First to fight against them. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Judah is praised. They say, send Judah first. Wait a minute. You ain't reading enough. Read verse 3. Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me and to my lot that we may fight against the Canaanites. Praise is Judah. Simeon is hearing and doing the word. And praise said, I ain't going nowhere if word don't come with me. So you better tell every praise brother. You better be in the Bible class. Get you some word. Praise and word go together. <laughs> How do you preach and help nobody? Here's how you preach and help nobody. Never live holy, just preach it. That way you'll be the hypocrite of the year. Here's how you preach and help. Here's how you preach and help nobody. Exalt everybody except Jesus. Because after all, he only went to Calvary. We have got to turn preaching around. Now, if you take the coin, how do you preach and help nobody? Flip the coin over. If you don't do that, go on back home and preach. And if you preach, God will bless it. He cannot lie. And if you go home and preach the word, go home and preach the gospel and preach the doctrine, yes, your church will double. Yes, your church will triple. Yes, your church will come. will do it because the word works. But if you have fallen into that dumb trap by them fellows who went to the same seminary and studied under the same professors and they learned their lesson well, and if you want to be like that, go ahead. Because that's a bunch I don't want to be nothing like. I'm trying my best to not be like them. I'm trying my best to not do like them. I'm doing my best like not to think like them. We call people charismatic. Charismatic is good. It means gifted. That's the wrong word. Worldly is what the word should be used. But the folks say, that ain't charismatic. To be charismatic means to have charisma and you gifted. And we use the word that to represent worldliness. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. They learn well. And they're doing it well. And people are getting exploited, hustled, and tricked because they have all learned well. And God do not want you to do that. That is not your assignment. Don't be like that. They have learned it. What did they learn? They learned how to preach and help nobody.